You are listening to the Place We Find Ourselves podcast. I'm Adam Young, and I'm joined today by Jenny McGrath, a therapist in Seattle who focuses on how trauma is stored in the body and how the body must be engaged in the healing of trauma. Jenny talks about how and why she began to take the body more seriously when it comes to healing. Some of the topics we'll cover today include why our body has a fight, flight, freeze response and how to work with our nervous system to facilitate healing. Remember, if you want to get episodes as soon as they are released, you need to head over to my website and click get the app. It only costs $3 a month, and you will be helping to make the podcast possible. Thanks for listening. Here's my interview with Jenny McGrath. Okay, I'm here with Jenny McGrath from Seattle. Jenny, it's good to see you. Good to see you, too. Why don't we begin by, can you just tell a little bit about who you are, what you spend your time doing? Yeah. So I am a licensed mental health counselor in Seattle, Washington, focused mostly on somatic psychotherapy. So I use a lot of incorporation of body with story work with clients in my private practice, but I also facilitate movement and therapeutic groups and I'm a, one of the core facilitators and supervisors with the Allender Center. So I do those on weekends where there's story workshops or certificate programs uh, and get to teach there with somatics of trauma and just integrating story work and body work is kind of what I like to nerd out reading about and researching is what I spend a lot of my time doing. Yeah. And that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about the body and the importance of engaging our physical bodies when it comes to what I would say just living well as a human being, but especially when it comes to addressing trauma. So maybe the best part to place the best place to start is just theologically. Like God created us as embodied creatures. And That is a truth that I don't think we've really grappled with, especially as kind of evangelicals in America. It means at at a minimum that your physical body is created in God's image, that it is good, that it matters. So your body is not merely a vessel that's carrying around this real part of you, like your soul. Your body, the physical body matters. It's created in God's image and it is so core to who each one of us is. When we speak of the body, when we speak of somatics, uh, when you use that term body and say you do body work, for example, what are you talking about? What what is included for you in that word body? Yeah, I agree. I think there's been such a split from our body and from what makes us, us. And so when I'm talking about body, I'm thinking of a holistic person. And I really love Elizabeth Moltman. She's a a feminine theologian and she has a book called I Am My Body. And I, I, I love that title and just a sense of when I'm talking about body, I'm talking about me and I'm talking about you. I'm talking about my clients and trying to step away from what's been this split and this focus of maybe spiritual or soul in a way that hasn't emphasized and hasn't talked about body. When I think of body, I, it, for me, it includes, uh, the breath, my breath. Mm -hmm. It includes the sensations of my gut, my heart, uh, what I'm feeling in my shoulders, what I'm feeling in my chest, what I'm feeling in my face for oftentimes when I get stressed, my facial muscles will tighten. And when we speak about body, we're talking about that. And we're also talking about the brain because the brain is part of the body. But at least when I think of it, I tend to think of, hey, let's talk about the neck down part of our bodies because they get those parts somehow get neglected when it comes to just life and certainly addressing trauma. 
Where my mind goes, and this is maybe a little into the weeds early on, is our vagus nerve, which I love. Uh, Resma Menachem, in his book, My Grandmother's Hands, he calls it our soul nerve, which I think is such a beautiful way of talking about what we're talking about, and that the body isn't separate from these ideas of soul, of spirit, of breath, and it really is the nerve that makes us human. And so as we kind of will get into talking more about what happens when the body has experienced trauma and how it's stored in the body, a lot of that comes through our vagus nerve and through hindrances of what allows us to taste, to smell, to breathe. Um, And so I think that is a very significant place that I go when I think about body is in terms of the nervous system, the vagus nerve, what is happening within the body that can allow it to feel and to be present or not. So you mentioned the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve is a cranial nerve. It starts in your brain and it and it innervates your viscera. So it innerv- it goes down. It has a lot of branches and it innervates your heart, your lungs, your gut, uh, lots of organs. And 80% of the messages from the vagus nerve are from the body to the brain. Mm-hmm. And so... Listeners, you have to understand that when you're living your day-to-day life, you are getting lots of messages from your viscera, from the organs in your body, via the vagus nerve to your brain. And your brain is then processing that data and letting you know something about your safety or your level of danger in this particular moment. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that's one of my kind of go-tos is the sense that we can't think our way into safety. We can't think our way into feeling secure, that it most of the time is this visceral, unconscious intuition. Um, It really is like, you know, we talk about our gut. It is our second brain in our belly telling our brain whether or not, you know, uh, most of our cortisol is actually produced in our gut. And so when we're stressed, when we're feeling heightened, it's coming from, just as you said, a bodily level up to our brain. So when you say you can't, we can't think our way into safety, we're going to, we're going to pause on that. I want to hold that and come back to that at the end when we talk about how do we address trauma from a somatic perspective, from a body perspective, but that's a really important sentence. So we're going to, we're just going to bookmark that. You can't think your way into safety, but before we get there, I just want to talk some more about like personally for you, what prompted you to begin to take the body more seriously in terms of just your own way of living life, addressing trauma, working with clients? What, what prompted you to begin to take the body more seriously? It really has been a lifelong process for me. And I think I grew up with this very ambivalent relationship with my body. Um, I grew up as a dancer. It was one of the most important things in my life. And so there always was this somewhat knowing of the body. And it was also more kind of used as a tool as like, how many spins can I do? How many leaps can I do? And um, kind of this very productive, so to speak, way of engaging my body. Um, And then when I was in high school, I broke my foot in dance class and it kind of derailed what I thought my path would be. I actually thought I would be a professional dancer. That was kind of my hope. And at the time, I didn't really know all of what dance or movement meant to me. I just knew I kind of ended up in a pretty dark place depression and didn't have language and didn't really know at the time that dance was my language. And so a very, very long story um, for today, but ended up as a missionary in Northern Uganda and 
was there by myself through my late teens and early 20s uh, with no knowledge really of what trauma was, of what vicarious trauma was, um, but was really impacted by the bodies that I was working with and actually was researching and trying to understand how movement and dance were being used to heal trauma with former child soldiers and kind of had this very outward focused, like looking at their bodies, but no connection to my own body. And so eventually I broke into shingles and my immune system shut down and my body basically just said, no, like no more of this. And it really became a time of reckoning where I think it it started to force me to integrate and have integrity of caring for my own body and recognizing what my body is, who my body is. Um, And so I ended up at Seattle, um, going to the Seattle school and unpacking my story, unpacking how um, certain theologies that I was raised in have impacted my way of relating to my body, my way of understanding my body. And It just started to put language to experiences that I hadn't had language for yet. And so um, have continued to do work of researching and studying movement, uh, but also allowing that to be a more embodied process for myself, too. Um, And so I really think it was actually my body that prompted me to take it seriously and kind of said, like, I'm not going to allow you to just use me. (laughs) I I need you to come back to me and invited me pretty abruptly um, to start to listen to the visceral messages, to start to trust my body and the sensations or the lack of sensations and kind of follow those without judgment and start to understand my story as it is held in my body. I love that phrase, come back to my body. Mm. I love the linkage of your story as something that is embodied in your physical body. When we talk about trauma being stored in the body, what does that mean to you? What I think of is these natural cycles that our body goes through when we experience stress. Um, And it can kind of either be called our, our polyvagal cycle or our stress cycle, which is essentially when we experience something stressful or frightening, our body moves into a state of sympathetic activation where we're in a fight or flight sense. And that's normal. It's natural. It's what our bodies do. If our body feels like, and again, it's this visceral level, I can't fight off what I'm going through. I can't run away. And so if we physically or psychically are in this entrapment, our body's last line of defense is to move into a state of freeze and a state of immobilization. And it's essentially the nervous system saying, let's play dead so that maybe at some point there's a hope of coming back to life. When I think about trauma being stuck in the body, I think about us being stuck in one of those states of fight, of flight, of freeze. And so however our stories have played out, however we've experienced trauma and needed those survival mechanisms, uh, I think it's such important language to understand that that's not bad if we're stuck in fight or flight or freeze, that that's our body's best attempt to keep us safe. And we might come to places where that isn't serving us as we once needed it to. Let's pause there for a minute. You're talking about something called polyvagal theory, which was developed by Stephen Porges. And listeners, if you're interested in reading more about the fight, flight, freeze, pathways in your body biologically, the person to read is either Porges or someone who has made it a little bit more understandable for clinicians is named Deb Dana. 
Polyvagal theory, I'm going to do a separate episode on it. It's kind of hard to understand, but it's extremely important when it comes to understanding why your body is reacting the way it is based on the trauma in your story. And for our purposes today, I just want to reiterate basically what you said, Jenny, which is that your body automatically and unconsciously, this is not volitional, your cortex is not involved in this, it automatically and unconsciously adapts to the safety or danger in your environment by either fighting or fleeing or freezing. So you might be in an argument with someone, who your spouse, a loved one, and it begins to feel unsafe for you. You unconsciously and automatically might respond to that by fighting. You power up. You argue harder. Or you might flee. You might le- literally leave the room and go in a different room. This is unconscious, automatic, nervous system responses uh, mediated by your vagus nerve that puts your body in an action tendency, i.e. fighting or leaving, or last, freezing. You might be in the room and be utterly frozen. You can be in the room, be frozen, and still be talking, particularly if you have a history of trauma because you learned how to do that. But your insides are frozen. They're frozen. Mm -hmm. All three of these states, fight, flight and freeze are states of suffering. Your body is suffering in in a state of, I would say, anti-shalom. You have cortisol and other chemicals that are coursing through your veins that put you on edge. Or conversely, they put you in a dissociated state where you are kind of checked out. So when we talk about trauma being stored in the physical body, that's what we're talking about. Your body has responses that are currently playing out in your relationships that are unconscious, automatic, and a function of your story. So Jenny, is a good question to ask, as I look back on my story, do I see tendencies towards fight, flight, or freeze? Is that a helpful question for listeners? Yeah, no, I I think so. I think using a great example of an argument with a spouse, like what are these knee-jerk reactions that our body has. And that can be maybe how it plays out in day to day. It can also be if we do have maybe some more significant traumas, uh, kind of with help of a safe person to talk through those to know how did my body respond in the moment. And I think this is really significant, especially when we're dealing with sexual abuse or stories of harm. There can be a lot of shame that comes from, I should have screamed or I should have fought him off. I think the best message that we can give ourselves and those that we're working with is your body did exactly what it needed to do because you survive. There's no right. There's no wrong. There just is like this isn't moral. Like you said, it's not conscious. This is the body taking over to preserve our life. And so I think we can look at it both how it might play out kind of throughout our life if we do have a tendency to erupt with rage or completely shut down and through engaging particularity of story and what the body did or didn't do in the midst of certain traumas. And I'm so glad you brought up sexual assault, sexual abuse. You have to understand these tendencies of the body to fight to flee or to freeze are automatic and unconscious. They are not volitional choices. And so if in your story you were 18 years old and you were sexually assaulted or date rape and your body froze and you went and you told somebody and they said, why didn't you scream? Why didn't you fight him off? It was in the middle of a party. There were people in the next room. Why didn't you do something? No, you don't understand. You had no volitional choice in what you did, your body, it's a, through a process called neuroception, your body surveyed what was happening to you and it adapted by fighting, fleeing or freezing. And that adaptation was wise. 
Yes. It was wise. In other words, your nervous system, informed by your story, but your nervous system made a quote unquote decision. But I don't even I don't know a better word than decision, but that word's not good because it implies choice and there is no choice. This happens via a process called neuroception, where your body detects a level of safety or danger and it adapts and acts accordingly. So please, listeners, if you have a story of sexual trauma and you froze, uh, well done. Mm-hmm. Well done. Yeah. Yeah. When it comes to engaging your story, uh, whether you have sexual trauma or not, when it comes to healing, when it comes to growing, maturing, paying attention to your body and attuning to your body is extremely important. That's the premise of this entire episode. Jenny, why is that the case? Why do I need, I'm I'm growing, I'm healing, I'm engaging my story. This is important stuff to me. Why do I need to start engaging my body and paying attention to it? Some of what I would say is to kind of recap what we've already said in, because I think it's so important and unfortunately, I think is so rare in our culture, especially, I know for me, again, growing up in very evangelical Christianity, there wasn't a big emphasis, if any, on the body, unless the body was bad or dangerous or sinful. And so I think getting to remind ourselves again and again and again that we are living embodiments of our story. That really is our story is our body. Without my body, I don't have my story. At this point, I don't know how to engage story without engaging the body. And I think, as you said, you know, 80 to 90% of our vagus nerve is afferent, sending messages from the body to the brain that we can't always consciously understand. We can't always cognitively reason through our story. Sometimes we only need to let the body complete the processes that it wasn't able to complete in the times of trauma. And so let me slow you down because you're saying so many important things quickly. I I just want to camp out here on this notion of completing actions. Can you give a real practical example, Jenny? One, when we're talking about this cycle of fight, flight, freeze, I think it can be really helpful to look at animals on the Amazon. So essentially when an antelope, when any animal that's more of a prey animal sees a predator, its immediate response is going to be to run. And, and you can watch these videos on YouTube if you are so inclined. Um, and you'll see that if a lion or a predator catches up with that antelope, it's going to, again, naturally just go into this freeze impulse. And what's amazing is that you can also watch videos of antelope or animals coming out of freeze. So say the lion got scared off or he left, something happened, you'll see the immediate reaction of the animal when it feels like it's safe to do so is to start taking these really deep breaths um, because our, our breath is what is the signal for our vagus nerve, whether we need to be in fight or flight or freeze. And so it starts to release these deeper breaths And then you'll see it, it almost looks like it's fast forwarded. These animals will just start shaking, they'll start kicking, they might run really quick. And it's because that cycle of fight, flight, freeze is a cycle. And so we can't just jump from freeze into being in our kind of rest and digest, I'm okay mode. The body has to discharge the energy, the cortisol, the adrenaline that was pumping through it in the time of immobilization. If I'm engaging certain stories with my clients of sexual abuse or times that they've been immobilized, and I start to notice them coming out of this freeze state, 
a lot of times they might start to feel tingling in their legs or tension in their chest. And so one of the things I just practically do with them is, is I might even have them squeeze my forearm and express that tension that's happening in their chest into my arm and let their body release and discharge and complete that really healthy aggression, that healthy fight flight response, and and get to know that it's okay for them to come back into a state of rest and digest. Yes. The bottom line is that our bodies store trauma and our bodies need to be recruited into the treatment of trauma or the resolution of trauma. And none of that can happen if you're not paying attention to your body. The main point of this whole episode is I want to invite you listeners to begin to or continue to pay attention to the sensations in your body, particularly during moments of either heightened affect or or lowered dissociated affect. And then also, particularly when you are talking about your story uh, and the traumatic parts of your story because your body will begin to feel sensations that you may not have been able to feel for decades. And when it does, the body needs to act out tendencies like that antelope when the lion is gone, its body starts shaking vigorously. God made our bodies to shake so that the discharge of energy restores our body to a state of shalom. But we in the West are not fond of letting our bodies move, much less shake. And this is tragic, and it's ending. It's ending, at least in the the communities that we're a part of, Jenny. We're beginning to take the body far more seriously, and we are seeing healing happen Because when the body is allowed to complete actions that it was not permitted to do in the midst of trauma, it naturally begins to experience healing. That's what I'm hearing you say. Yeah. For me, a lot of teaching and theology was kind of this demonizing of anger, like anger is this bad thing and you should never feel it. Uh, But from a a visceral level, if we can't feel healthy aggression, if we can't feel that fight flight, our only choice then is immobilization. Um, And so I think it is so important to let our bodies be able to work through and resolve that healthy aggression um, that can let them feel a sense of agency and empowerment to be able to live well. What feels really important to name is, uh, I think where this is a very tricky place for me and has been for a while is I recognize that as a white woman, I have a privilege of having places where I can feel safe, uh, where I can come into rest and digest. I think it is really important to hold that not everybody, not every person of color especially, is going to have a sense that they can feel safe in their body. And so what I love about somatically engaging story is it can look so different and really honor not only the particular individual trauma, but also create a container for collective trauma, for systematic trauma, for generational and racial trauma that I think has to be engaged, especially, you know, if I'm working with a person of color and how trauma can be triggered even in us being in the room together. And so this brings us back to the book that that Jenny mentioned earlier called My Grandmother's Hands by Resma Menekum. And in the book, he lays out how black bodies have been assaulted historically in this country. They have been rendered under suspicion. And as a result, if you have a black body, 
uh, your engagement with your body is going to inevitably involve dealing with the collective systemic trauma of white supremacy and racism if you grew up in America. And so what I'm hearing you say is that this is fraught. Dealing with the body is fraught. Addressing the body is fraught. And that's particularly true if you are not in the dominant culture because your body has been viewed as suspicious, dangerous. It has been viewed as second class and it has been treated uh, with contempt. And that is all held. What Menekum is saying in my grandmother's hands, it's just such a brilliant work. And he's just simply saying, look, racism is embodied. Yeah. And, and what I love is, is how he also shares that racism is embodied in white bodies, too. We don't often think of us as white bodies as a collective body. And that's, again, where it's so hard to answer the question of what is body. Like, I have my individual body and... I am part of a collective white body that has created, that has survived off of systems of oppressing other bodies. And so that trauma is also in my body. And I think that's such important work as white bodies to do as we're engaging story. Thank you for listening. Sorry to cut it short abruptly, but stay tuned for part two uh, in two weeks. I will continue my conversation with Jenny about trauma and our bodies. 